You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, Episode 14, Sonnet 13, and a preview of Sonnet 128. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if, if I, I say I'm not, not just another no. one in your place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What, what if, if I, I say I will never, never surrender? surrender? Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions and as importantly for showing faith in a project I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. Tattoos 2 and 3 hurt. My patrons have access to the live stream, and while the first couple of hours were alright, by the end I'd spent a large quantity of the time yelling and cursing and apologizing and generally just wanting the whole thing to be over. The good news is that in spite of my weakness, the two tattoos came out beautifully, and I'm particularly impressed with Sonnet 3 as it received a last minute treatment of having the actual sonnet text on the back plate, which was unexpected because I didn't expect either of the tattoos to be so big and large enough to do that. The healing has been a lot less traumatic than sonnet 1, although the itching has only just begun and it is distracting. I'm stupidly excited to be adding sonnets 4 and 5 on Wednesday, at which point I'll be caught up on my initial plan of a sonnet a month since October. Additionally, I must share that over the past week, I have finally begun reading Golding's translation of Ovid's Metamorphosis to my three-year-old, and it's been as good for my knowledge as it is a thoroughly effective lullaby for my son. A word of advice to those of you brave enough to try it, if you put on even a terrible Scottish accent, the rhymes work really well. I strongly suspect that the Scottish have preserved the Middle English accent a lot better than the English. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 13. Oh, that you were yourself, but love you are, no longer yours, than you yourself here live. Against this coming end you should prepare, and your sweet semblance to some other give. From the perspective of the sonnet side of the looking glass, the sonnet is speaking both to Shakespeare and to the reader. As aspects of Shakespeare's spirit are being transmuted into the words of the sonnet, they no longer belong to him alone, just as he himself does not get to live in the sonnet, but must die a natural death while his copies continue on their adventure. While the reader's attention is focused on reading the sonnet, they give themselves over to it and, in their imaginations only, live in the world that the sonnet creates. When the writing of this sonnet comes to an end, Shakespeare must lend his spirit to another sonnet, and when the reading comes to an end, the reader must continue on to the next one. From our side of the looking glass, the sonnet's self is Shakespeare, but that self does not belong to it. The sonnet exists only in the minds of the author and the reader. The sonnet must prepare for the eventuality that it will be completed by the author or reader, and must move on to search for another sweet semblance. This is reinforced in the word semblance, which suggests an imitation of the bard, which is a sonnet. So should that beauty which you hold in lease find no determination, then you were yourself again, after yourself's decease, when your sweet issue, your sweet form should bear. The word lease follows the established theme of legal tender and contracts, with a connotation of temporary. Temporary, in context of the sonnet sequence, is the state of the biological author, the reader, and the ephemeral reading experience. Determination, in Shakespeare's day, meant decision, a sentence in a suit at law, and the end of a lease. In this context, we can reword So should that beauty which you hold in lease find no determination as Let us hope that this contract with beauty does not come to an end. So the first two lines of this quatrain speak to all three actors. For Shakespeare, his beauty borrowed from nature is loaned to the sonnet sequence. For the sonnets, it is the bard's borrowed beauty that is loaned to the reader. And for the reader, the beauty of the sonnets rents space in the reader's mind. In this way, Shakespeare can continue to be himself, repeatedly, even after his body has died. Issue, at the time, had a few meanings, including an exit or leaving, a discharge of fluid from the body, offspring or children, an outcome of action or consequence, and legally the end or result of pleadings in a suit, implying a point of contention between two parties. The last line of this quatrain can be plainly read as when your sonnets carry your form, but as the quatrain has already established a legal theme, 
It seems reasonable to suggest that the sweet issue may refer to the contention between the sonnet's love for Shakespeare, their duty to be discharged, and their relationship with the reader, or simply the argument that the sonnet makes on Shakespeare's behalf. Who lets so fair a house fall to decay, which husbandry in honour might uphold, against the stormy gusts of winter's day, and barren rage of death's eternal cold? Husbandry, referred to a few times earlier in the sequence, meant farm management, but it originally meant management of a household, which here seems more appropriate in addition to the pun on being a good husband and having children. The phrase barren rage can be read with barren as an adjective describing empty or unconstructive rage, either about death's eternal cold or by death's eternal cold, or as a noun, in which case it would be a barren person who rages about death's eternal cold. Shakespeare had already let his house fall to decay, to his shame, even if whatever had taken Hamlet's life was outside of his control. This quatrain is self-reflective. But if the output of his rage was the sonnet sequence, then it was anything but barren. It simultaneously attempts to motivate the sonnets to uphold Shakespeare's honour to protect the bard from a more final death. O oh, none but unthrifts, dear my love, you know. You had a father. Let your son say so. As mentioned before, the word unthrift only appears three times in the sonnet sequence, in sonnets 4, 9 and 13. I find it intriguing that 4 is 2 squared, 9 is 3 squared, and 13 is 4 plus 9. In Sonnet 11's analysis, I mentioned that there's a lot of numerical play in the sequence, mentioning that Sonnet 11's 3 score appears to refer to Sonnet 60, and in the previous podcast, I forgot to mention that while Sonnet 12 works with the hours of the clock, it also links to Sonnet 60, which says, Our minutes hasten to their end. I'm not sure what the numbers 4, 9, and 13 signify, but I'm pretty certain that this isn't just a coincidence. As a father, there's something I find particularly heart-wrenching in the final verse. The sonnets serve Shakespeare by replacing his son, and so this line was written by a grieving father to his son's memory. You had a father, then, takes on a powerful new meaning. You had a father, Hamnet. Let your sonnet say so. Some wonderful people are putting together a documentary called A Bard for the Ages, Shakespeare's Timeless Effect, and are looking for submissions. And I'd like to share mine with you, in addition to a link to more information in the description if you'd like to participate yourself. Sonnet 128 How oft, when thou, my music, music playest, Upon that blessed wood whose motion sounds, With thy sweet fingers, when thou gently swayest, the wiry concord that mine ear confounds. Do I envy those jacks that nimble leap to kiss the tender inward of thy hand, whilst my poor lips, which should that harvest reap, at the wood's boldness by thee blushing stand? To be so tickled, they would change their state and situation with those dancing chips, o'er whom thy fingers walk with gentle gait, making dead wood more blessed than living lips. Since saucy jacks so happy are in this, give them thy fingers, me thy lips to kiss. Shakespeare's sonnets, one of the most tragic and beautiful pieces of writing in the English language, is the bard's last will and testament, a monument to his son, and it captures Shakespeare's spirit in poetry in an effort to keep his legacy alive for all eternity. Each sonnet is a little song as well as a little son, and the framing of the sonnet sequence is the story of Narcissus and Echo, as translated from Ovid's Metamorphosis by Arthur Golding. The wood instrument is the sonnet sequence, with its pages made of trees, and the ear that is confounded by the wiry concord is Shakespeare's, because a long-decayed corpse cannot hear anything. Sonnet 128 is Shakespeare telling the reader that his music is produced by the reader's fingers playing over the words of his saucy sonnets, which leap to kiss the reader's tender palms as the pages are turned, and as the reader reads the words aloud, the bard's spirit reaches out across the centuries to kiss the reader's lips as his words pass by. Shakespeare's sonnets are the only works that he has intentionally published himself, and they form the backbone of the large body of work that we continue to marvel at today.
Even by today's standards, they are utterly groundbreaking, literally amazing, and open 154 windows into the soul of arguably the greatest author who has ever lived. It is a timeless work, and as relevant as ever. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording these podcasts, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support me at www.patreon.com slash Fisher King. And please join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnet comics with an X. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another not one in your place? You're, you're the, the pretender. pretender. What, what if I say I will never surrender? surrender?